I mean, shifting from my Loma to AML, and I dream, I hope one time in AML we have this option of treatment like in my Loma. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Ghazi. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you for SSBMT, Dr. Askar, for this nice uh, conference, and thank you for Astilla. Okay. So we'll speak today about uh, relapse refractory uh, FLT3 mutated uh, AML. Uh, so we all know that uh, the field of AML has been significantly improved over the last years. Uh, I mean, our understanding of uh, AML has been significantly improved, and this is due to the advances in molecular study and mutational analysis. We now have better classification of AML, and this is clearly translated on the new WHO. We are moving now from the uh, morphological based to more molecular based diagnosis and even the, the, the paradigm is shift in AML treatment from intensive chemo transplant to more of targeted therapy and over the last couple of years a couple of targeted therapy has been approved for, for AML and more now under work in preclinical and clinical so we hope more option will come for AML. So we know AML is a heterogeneous disease, and a couple of mutations has been identified, and we know that FLT3 mutation is one of the common mutations. It's around 37% of AML will have FLT3 mutation. And we know that AML is a tyrosine kinase uh, receptor, and like other, other, other tyrosine kinase receptor, we have the extracellular and the intramembrane and the intracellular kinase uh, domain. And we have commonly two types of mutation in FLT3, the FLT3 internal tandem duplication, which is usually on the juxtamembrane site or juxtamembrane domain. We have also the FLT3 uh, tyrosine kinase point uh, mutation. It's on the tyrosine kinase uh, domain. The FLT3 ITD is account for almost 30%, and it's clear negative prognostic uh, marker for AML. FLT3 TKD around 7 to 10%, and it's actually controversial about the prognostic factor, but the good thing that we have targeted uh, treatment now even for FLT3 TKD. So all of you, all of us, we know that FLT3 uh, ITD negatively impact the outcome of acute myeloid leukemia, and this is, has been clear uh, before the uh, targeted therapy for, uh, M for FLT3. This is one of the earlier study for FLT3 ITD mutated AML. It's around 20, 20, 2002, and this is on the intensive chemotherapy era without targeted therapy, and you can see clearly that FLT3 mutated AML they had shorter duration of remission compared to FLT3 wild type uh, AML, and this is translated for shorter uh, overall survival for FLT3 mutated AML, AML compared to uh, wild type. And this is before the targeted therapy during the, inter the intensive chemotherapy era. So we all know that FLT3 ITD negatively impact the outcome of AML by mainly increasing the relapse. Uh, shorter disease uh, free survival and definitely shorter overall survival. Uh, we all aware about the new ALEN uh, classification 2022. We used before to debate a lot uh, when we have patients with NPM1 mutated and low allelic ratio FLT3, shall we transplant them, not to transplant them? It was a common debate and most of us were advocating to transplant them, especially we don't have a good uh, MRD marker to follow. And now with the new uh, European Leukemia Net classification, all FLT3 now is uh, intermediate risk, so no more favorable risk for FLT3. So now uh, we should advocate more any FLT3 mutated AML. If you can transplant them up front, they should proceed for transplant. There are several changes in the alien criteria. I will not go through them. So we clearly know that FLT3 mutation negatively affect the newly diagnosed AML. So how about FLT3 mutation in relapse refractory AML? Can you fix it? Just, uh, okay. Not the glass. I think it's 
Yeah, so we said that uh, the flat 3 ITD is clearly negatively impact the So we know that all all relapse refractory ML they do poor, yani, but uh, even though the flat 3 positive AML and relapse they, even, they do even more negative impact than the flat 3 wild type on relapse and this is uh, two cohort study with the FLT3 mutated AML upon relapse, and you can see the overall survival is very poor, less than 10% for relapse FLT3 if they have, if relapse AML if they have FLT3 positive. And here is a very important point. So we know that AML is heterogeneous disease, and it's also a dynamic disease. So the mutation can change with AML, and we know that FLT3 is a late mutation, and it's unstable mutation. It can evolve with relapse and sometimes disappear with relapse. Uh, so here an example, one retrospective study, uh, patient with FLT3 negative AML, there are around 260 patients. Upon relapse, 10% of them uh, relapse with acquired FLT3 ITD mutation. The other way around, 60 patients with FLT3 ITD mutation alone, uh, prior to therapy, they relapsed without FLT3 mutation. And this is very nice work by Dr. Takahashi from MD Anderson when they did a single uh, cell analysis. And you can see how is the, uh, uh, the clone change with time with treatment. Example, this patient had NPM1 mutation. <laughs> Upon diagnosis, the main clone was FLT3 ITD, treated with sorafenib A as achieved remission, then when relapsed. And you can see that initially he had very small clone of FLT3 TKD. And upon relapse, the FLT3 ITD disappeared, and the main clone with relapse is FLT3 TKD. And it makes sense because sorafenib will not affect FLT3 TKD. So the main message here that when you have relapsed AML, you have to test for mutation, especially FLT3 and other mutation that you have targeted therapy for them. How about FLT3 inhibitors? There is a couple of FLT3 inhibitors in pipe, in, in, on, on the pipeline. So we have the first generation, second generations. The first generation sorafenib, it's usual, it's the old FLT3, I mean, uh, old uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, some of them meant for other malignancy. So they inhibit a wide range of tyrosine kinase, so you'll have a wide uh, side effect, off-target side effect, sorafenib, mydostorine. The second generation, it's more selective, more potent, uh, and less uh, off-target uh, uh, side effect, like cuzartinib, uh, crinolinib, and giltretinib. And the other classification for FLT3 inhibitor, we divide them based on the functions. We have FLT3 type 1 and type 2. Type 1 affects the FLT3 inhibitor in the active and inactive uh, conformation. So it's work in FLT3 ITD and FLT3 TKD. Example, the uh, uh, giltretinib and mydostorine. FLT uh, type 2 inhibitors is mainly work on inactive and it's mainly work for ITD, not TKD. And the example is uh, sorafenib and cuzartin. And here example of couple of clinical trials that uh, on FLT3 inhibitors, we all aware about ratified trials, which led for approval of uh, mydostorine in upfront uh, fit patient in combination with intensive chemotherapy, and there was clear survival benefit. We know the Admiral trial, we will explain it in more detail and shortly, and led to approval of giltretinib for relapse refractory, uh, FLT3 positive AML. Uh, Quantum R uh, was looking for cuzartinib versus intensive chemotherapy for relapse refractory FLT3 ITD. There was survival benefit, but for some reason did not lead to approval FDA. It's approved in Japan. Uh, I should have added the quantum first uh, uh, trials that now show a benefit of cuzartinib plus with 3 plus 7, and we think it will lead for approval of cuzartinib in upfront AML patient. So let's focus on relapsed refractory FLT3 mutated AML, and the only approved uh, targeted therapy in this uh, situation is giltretinib. As we said, giltretinib is highly selective oral FLT3 inhibitor, active on both FLT3 ITD and FLT3 TKD. Uh, giltretinib is a first uh, is is a type one FLT3 inhibitor. It's bind to to ATP site, so it's highly selective for FLT3. That's mean less of target mutation, and we all know that in the uh, FLT in the giltretinib is approved for relapsed refractory AML and it is uh, category one in NCC and guideline. 
And this, uh, this approval is based on the Admiral trial. It is a phase three randomized trial that compared giltritinib to a standard of care for relapse uh, refractory FLIT3 ITD and TKD uh, AML patient. And patient was randomized the two to one to either giltritinib 120 milligram and patient will continue daily until uh, intolerance or progression and uh, salvage therapy either intensive chemotherapy one or two cycles or low intensive chemotherapy until progression or intolerance both group allowed to proceed for uh, stem cell transplant based on investigator uh, choice and giltritinib group allowed to uh, resume giltritinib after relapse and importantly there was no crossover uh, offered on these trials uh, this is also ex explanation of the choice of low intensive uh, chemotherapy was low dose uh, cytorabine or azacitidine. The high intensive chemo was MIC or flag IDA. This is the patient characteristic and you can see it's almost equal between the two groups. The median age was around 60 in, the, in both group. Uh, the cytogenetics was equal. The unfavorable risk was 10% and the guilt retina 11 or 8% on the intensive chemo. Uh, we need to know the FLT3 inhibitors in both the briefest exposure to FLT3 inhibitor in both group was 13% in the giltritinib group, 11% on the intensive uh, uh, chemo or in standard uh, uh, regimen. So here is the main uh, uh, outcome for the study, the overall survival benefit of giltretinib compared to standard uh, regimen, which intensive chemo or low intensity chemotherapy. And we can see clearly that patient with giltretinib had better survival compared to salvage chemotherapy. The median was 9.3 months compared to 5.6 months on salvage chemotherapy. One year overall survival was 37% compared to 17%. And when they did the uh, long-term follow-up after two years from the uh, uh, study, the uh, overall benefit of giltretinib continued, and the median 9.3 compared to 5.6. Uh, two important points here that we need uh, uh, to know that uh, more patient on giltretinib group went for or underwent stem cell transplant compared to salvage group. 25% on giltretinib group compared to 15%, around 10% difference. And, and this has raised the question, is this survival benefit in giltretinib group is due to, to more stem cell transplant or because of the disease itself? We'll come to how to answer this question. The other point here that 60% uh, of patients resumed guilt in a post-transplant. So the question come, is there is any, any difference between patients who resumed guilt in a post-transplant compared to patients did not resume? But this is, was not planned. So this is, will be post hoc analysis. We'll come to it. So to answer the question, is there is any effect of a stem cell transplant on the outcome? Uh, we know that transplant was more in the giltretinib group compared to uh, uh, stand or salvage chemotherapy group. But when they did uh, censoring at stem cell transplant time, and that means they will not capture the outcome after transplant, the overall survival is still clearly uh, better uh, with giltretinib group compared to salvage chemotherapy group when they censored the patient at transplant time. The median was around eight months compared to five months. This is a post hoc analysis. It's not bland analysis. We'll not take it by guarantee, but it just gives us a hint about the possibility of benefit of guilt rate in a post transplant. And we all now know the press release of the uh, MORPHO trial. Maybe there is no benefit of guilt rate in maintenance. But on this post hoc analysis, there was clear benefit of patient who resumed guilt rate in a post transplant compared to patient who did not resume it. Post transplant, 16 months compared to 8.4 months. This is again a post hoc analysis. This is to look for the co-primary uh, endpoint, the CR, CRH, and it's clearly better on the giltretinib group compared to a salvage uh, group, 34% 30, compared to 15%. But you need to keep in mind the giltretinib continued and the uh, intensive chemo is one or two months only. The side effect, when we look to the first 30 days, it's almost comparable between the two groups. The cytopenia is almost the same. Maybe there's more neutropenia on the chemotherapy group, but the more uh, 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 transaminase on the giltretinib group compared to salvage chemotherapy group. 
So I will get, uh, I'll take you shortly about uh, to see uh, two cases from our clinic, one of them I just saw here last week. Uh, so this is the first case, a uh, 23-year-old lady presented in outside hospital with flu-like symptom, sore throat, non-specific symptom. They found that she had a leukocytosis. Uh, initial workup suggested of AML, so they referred her to us. Uh, when she came to us in King Faisal, this is her initial lab, white blood cell around 20. She had 29% circulating plast, thrombocytopenia, uh, bone marrow biopsy, hypercellular marrow, 55% plast, flow, uh, going with myeloid uh, neoplasm. Her cytogenetic was translocation 69, so she's high risk disease. Uh, NPM1 FLT3 ITD was negative initially. At that time, we did not have the NGS. Uh, result for her, so we treated her as FLT3 ITD negative uh, AML high risk, so she underwent 7 plus 3, our standard induction. She achieved CR. Uh, we had a match sibling for her, so she went directly after 7 plus 3 to uh, fully myeloablative B16 site transplant. She did well, tolerated the transplant, engrafted nicely. Her chimerism continued to be 100% on day plus 30, plus 90 plus 60, plus 90. Uh, because of higher high risk disease, we tapered immunos immunosuppression therapy early. We were able to stop it uh, more be before day 100. Uh, but unfortunately, she had disease relapse around day 100, 120 post-transplant. And workup at that time showed again back translocation 69 as expected. But uh, surprisingly, she had FLT3 ITD, or this is expected with translocation 69. Uh, she had FLT3 ITD positive on relapse. We did for her NGS this time, only FLT3 ITD, no other mutations. So she's four months post transplant. She was not fit for intensive chemotherapy. We did not have giltretinib at that time available, so we offered her ASA, venuticlax, a salvage therapy. And we did for her day 21 bone marrow. She was hypocellular 20 to 30 percent. There was no morphological evidence of disease, but her fish was her cytogenetic were positive. Flit 3 ITD was still positive. We gave her at that time the first DLI, and uh, with count recovery, we had the giltretinib arrived. So we started here on giltretinib. We were able to give her almost two months of giltretinib. Uh, she continued to be cytopenic. Uh, we did the bone marrow around, like, after two months of giltretinib, 40% cellularity, 10% blast. The blast percentage was not accurate. The bone marrow was suboptimum. But the, the fish was positive for translocation 6.9. FLT3 ITD was also positive. So at this point, uh, she maybe had some response to giltretinib. It's not clear. So we decided to continue giltretinib, but to add for her a triplet. So we added ASA plus venetoclax with giltretinib. And very important, this is a very heavy myelosuppressive uh, regimen. So we have to adjust the medication. We give her giltretinib 80. And then I think we give it for 10 days only. And we planned for DLI without repeating the bone marrow. So around day 21, 22 with cytopenia, we give her augmented uh, DLI. Uh, she had a nice count recovery. This is her lab on last Sunday, on 21st of May. I saw her in the clinic. This is her best, the best count for her since she had relapsed. The platelet is 164, ANC is 100, uh, 1,200. And we did the bone marrow, and I just got the result on Thursday. She had 40% cellularity, no evidence of disease by immunomorphology, still bending FLT3 ITD and cytogenetics, still bending chimerism. But I hope that she's clearly showing some response to giltretinib. So my plan is to continue here on giltretinib-based therapy, and I will give her more DLI if she had no GVHD. The other case, uh, she was seen in Dr. Uh, Sayyid Uthman, our colleague clinic. She's 22-year-old uh, female, presented in December 2018 with syncopal attack that was in outside hospital. Uh, pancytopenia, bone marrow confirmed AML, uh, against translocation 69. She had FLT3 ITD positive from the beginning. Uh, she received 3, three plus 7 plus mydostorin uh, uh, as induction. She achieved CR. Uh, received one cycle of IDAC. There was issue about transplant, so they gave her one IDAC. Unfortunately, disease relapsed at that time. There was some delay on the transplant. Uh, they salvaged her again with chemo plus, uh, I think this time they gave her sorafenib. 
She achieved CR2, normal cytogenetic, FLT3, ITD negative. She underwent haplotransplant from her mother in October 2019. It was complicated by gut and hepatic GVHD. Uh, she received a post-BMT uh, sorafenib maintenance. But unfortunately, she relapsed almost one year in August 2020. Uh, they gave her a salvage guilt retin based therapy. They started with triplet uh, guilt retin azavin and referred her to us for possible second haplotransplant. When she came to us, she was treated outside Saudi Arabia. Uh, when she came to us, her count was a bit acceptable, platelet 54, uh, NCs around 300. No circulating blast, but we did for her bone marrow, and that was around four cycles of triplet. And the bone marrow was hypocellular. There is no blast, but uh, still uh, cytogenetic positive for translocation 69, and molecular was still positive for FLT3 ITD despite four cycles of triplet guilt retinib A7. Uh, so we kept her on single agent guilt retinib at that time, and then we prepared her father for second haplo. She was clinically fit at that time. After long discussion in our BMT, we agreed to proceed for TBI based. Uh, second haplotransplant uh, on April 2021. She engrafted and tolerated the transplant very well, and, bom and the bone robust transplant, she was in CR, normal cytogenetic, FLT3 ITD was negative, uh, started on guilt retin post transplant on around day plus 40, and alhamdulillah, she continued to be on remission on guilt retin, and now she passed two years post transplant, and we're able to stop guilt retin after two years and she continued to be on remission. So in conclusion, AML, as we said, is a molecular heterogeneous uh, disease, and FLT3 ITD mutation is clearly independent uh, negative prognostic factor for AML, and uh, molecular testing for FLT3 is very important at diagnosis and at uh, relapse. Uh, targeted therapy offer a tolerable and maybe improved option for treatment of AML, especially for FLT3 ITD positive on relapse. And there is clearly unmet need for maintenance therapy post transplant for FLT3 uh, mutated AML. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed.